faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resume. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Jared Moon here, and welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. Today, we have Dr. Sean Baker, very, very interesting human being and very fascinating conversation we had. So real quick, uh, I'm I'm just going to read this from his Twitter profile, uh, just because I, I think that it really sums it up. Uh, This is one of his his tweets that kind of describes what he's all about. And he says, just your average backflipping, basketball dunking, quarter ton deadlift repping, 80 kilogram kettlebell swinging, world record rowing, 50 year old carnivore MD. So very, very uh, well-versed athlete, very powerful athlete, holds a, a world record in the 500 meter row. Uh, I think, I think we, we get into it, but I think it's like a minute 14, just super powerful. Uh, and like I said, medical doctor spent some time in the air force. He's done a lot of cool things, but what I think you might find the most fascinating is that he, he, he eats meat. Now you're thinking, oh yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. I, I eat meat too. What's, what's so cool about that? No, no, no. He eats meat period dot. That's it. He only eats meat. He's on what we call a carnivore diet. He only eats meat, namely beef, steak. He eats a lot of steak steak every single day, and that's it. Nothing else. He doesn't supplement with anything. No vegetables, no sweet potatoes, nothing else. He eats meat. And he's been doing it for, I think, over a year now. There's kind of a a community of people who are also doing this with him. So keep an open mind, guys, and listen to this podcast in its entirety. Get everything you can. Because he's not some dogmatic person who follows this super strict diet. Like, if you go to the vegan side of things, the vegans can be tend to be a little dogmatic sometimes. And then they can get very offended when you when you challenge their ideas or or speak against it. He's not like that. He is doing what works for him and works for a lot of other people. And he's kind of being a pioneer down this path. And he has a very open mind. Of course, he's very, very knowledgeable, very smart person. Uh, not some crazy guru who's like trying this. He's a, he's a medical doctor doing this, guys. So listen to it in its entirety. Take notes. I found it very, very fascinating. Uh, but without any further ado, here is Dr. Sean Baker. All right, Dr. Baker, I'm super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. Thanks a lot for joining me today. Hey, Jared, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. So we're going to, before we got, I'm super excited for this conversation, but before we even hop into that, we like to give our listeners some challenges and some recommendations. So I'm going to throw those to you uh, and see what you come up with. So first, could you give everyone listening today a fitness challenge? Uh, yeah, I think, well, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I'm a big fan of the concept to rowing machine. And so I, I, I set a world record in the 500 meter. And so I think a max out 500 meter row is always a, a pretty taxing effort. You know, um, see if you can get it under 130 for a guy and under 145 for a girl would be would be a reasonable number. Uh, I also like uh, heavy kettlebell swing. So I think a, a fair level of effort would be half your body weight for 50 reps in a row. I think that would be a a pretty stout challenge for most people. Wow, yeah, that would be incredible. And what's your what, what was your time on the uh, 500 meter row? My best time is one minute fourteen point five seconds. Wow, that's blazing, blazing. That's incredible. All right, how about a uh, mental toughness challenge? Uh, well, I I'm a big fan of taking really cold showers, and so I think you know if you don't take them, get in there and take a a five minute cold showers and, and start cold the whole way. I think that's a, that's a good way to sort of uh uh overcome some fears so i think that's a primal fear everybody has and so you just got to get through those first few seconds and then then it becomes kind of oddly pleasurable (laughs) all right awesome yeah i love i'm a big fan of uh cold showers so i love that recommendation or challenge should i say and uh but that that brings us to the last one so how about a book recommendation 
Uh, you know, the, the most recent one I read was a book called Sapiens, which I think is, is quite interesting from, from just a human evolution and human uh, cultural development standpoint. So I think that's a good read. Okay, awesome. Awesome. I will note that, jot that down. Uh, I've had that book recommended more than a few times, so I got to get it knocked out. It sounds like it's an awesome book. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah, it's worth reading, definitely. All right, so if you could give me, you know, you could just kind of your background and, and what you're doing now, uh, and then we can kind of hop into, uh, I'll just hop into anything I get from you telling me your background and, and where you're at today. Uh, I'll, I'll dot, jot down some notes, and those will be my jumping off points. But if you could kind of just introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you're up to these days. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of a bit of an unconventional type of person. You know, my background was, uh, you know, I went to school, University of Texas, got a degree in biology, went on to medical school. About a year into it, I left medical school to go play professional rugby down in New Zealand. It was just kind of an odd <laughs> direction. So I did that for, for a few years and then came back in. And then at that time, I, I ended up going into the United States Air Force and became a nuclear weapons launch officer and i continued to play rugby for the armed forces team and the all all military teams and and, and for various uh, high level teams in the u.s for about about seven years until i finally got tired of getting my head kicked in and so then i went back to medical school uh at this time the the, the military paid for it uh and then i went and then I got, then I, you know, I was deployed to Afghanistan where I did a bunch of trauma surgery, a lot of just hundreds and hundreds of trauma operations. Saw this really, you know, this crazy stuff you never see in your life. And then I uh, went on to go into private practice for a while. And now I've kind of stepped away from that. Uh, I've, got, I've gotten where, you know, my, you know, I just kind of, I've, I've gotten more into health than I have gotten into medicine. And it's kind of funny, you know, it's, it's, you know, when you, you, you go into medicine, you think you're, you're there to help people, then you realize that the sort of the healthcare system is not really set up for that. It's mostly disease management. My real passion in my heart was into trying to get people healthier and prevent disease and, and make people better, you know, just just better humans, basically. And I think maybe that's I think that's the name of your podcast, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. That's why and that's why you're here, you know, because I think first off, that is that's an amazing um background you know rugby to air force to doctor you know that's that's a lot of uh amazing accomplishments that yeah i've done that. yeah i've done a lot of different you know i had a lot of different, a lot of different sports you know i was kind of like i started rugby and then i was a power lifter and ended up breaking a you know a few american records in the in the in the deadlift i was i had a 772 pound deadlift at one point and that was you know i've been a drug free drug free athlete my whole life and so i was pretty pretty pleased with that and then i Went on to do some strongman stuff and had decent, you know, reasonable success at the strongman level. You know, in the early in the early days, this was you know 15 years ago before it got popular. And then I went on to throwing, where I won the world championships, the masters. I was over 40 at that time, so I won the masters world championships in Highland Games, which is, you know, throwing cabers. You get, you know, you wear a kilt and you throw all these heavy things. So I learned how to throw stuff and. You know, recently, like I said, I took up this indoor rowing and I've, I've broken numerous world records on the indoor rowing machine. So I've been an athlete my whole life. It's been a really, you know, big part of who I am. And so I've, I've really, you know, gotten I've, I've had the pleasure of training with a lot of Olympic gold medalists and world champions in different sports. And that's kind of influenced how I train. And I've taken kind of pieces from all this different all these different sports I've had success with. And I've developed a pretty good you know, system of training for uh what gets the job done I, I found what's very efficient and what's a waste of time you know there's a lot of trends that are out there and i watch people do them and then i see that they come and go and i see a lot of things that i mean they're just not very efficient and they tend up they end up being you know this there are skills that people build but they don't really help them in their goal on fitness and so i think there's a, a difference between training for a sport where it's really highly skill specific and then there's sort of fitness and health oriented goals where those those highly you know, skill dependent, uh, exercises tend to, tend to be a waste of time. And so what is, what is your training looking like today? And what, before I get to that, um, if you're, if you're pounding out a minute 14 on a 500 meter row, uh, how tall are you? You pretty tall guy? I'm six, five. And I, I usually weigh, you know, I'm usually around 240 pounds. So yeah, I'm, I'm not a small person, you know, rowing, you know, there's a, there's a, I'm, you know, right now there's, you know, and I'm 50 years old and there's only a handful of guys in the world that are faster than me at the 500. And most of those guys are about 30, 40 pounds heavier than me. And, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, a lot of them are six, eight, six, nine. So it's, it's definitely, a, it favors, you know, height 
in 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 size for sure. Yeah, that's what uh most any people rowing at that level, I, I assume there's some height involved. And so I was just curious. And so what is your training looking like today? So my training is, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because I, I tie this into health, you know, and, and, and so I think what we need to be able to do as we get older and most people lose this capacity, you know, you need, you need to maintain some muscle mass. So there's some, you know, some hypertrophy type work that needs to be done. You need to, you need to maintain your strength level. So I do a lot of basic, you know, basic movement, strength training stuff. And then I think beyond that, I think that one of the biggest things we leave out is the ability to accelerate and to be explosive. And so I do a lot of jumping, throwing, uh, you know, Olympic lifting variants, uh, things like that. And then, then, then I do a lot of sprinting. You know, I do a lot of just, you know, I want to be able to maintain speed. And then I do a lot of just, just high end conditioning stuff. And so I don't do a lot of, you know, uh, long steady state cardio, things like that. It's more geared to preserving muscle mass and preserving, you know, athletic function. You know, if you look at an animal in a wild and it's kind of, you know, and it's true for humans too. You know, the, one of the biggest factors for longevity and health span is our is our capacity to exercise. And so, I think once you get farther and farther away from what you could do, let's say the average person, you know, athletically peaks in their mid twenties to early thirties. You know, that's when most people are the biggest, strongest, and fastest. And so, the the farther you get away from that, you know, as you get into your forties and fifties and sixties, you slow down. You uh, lose a capacity to, to run and sprint and things like that. You know, things that kids do this naturally, you know, you don't see kids out there warming out and stretching. I mean, they get out there and run and play and it's no problem. So the farther we get away from that as a, as a, as a, just as a, as a person, the closer we are to getting sicker and, and eventually dying. And so I think the more you can preserve what you had in your twenties in your forties and fifties is what's going to keep you healthy the best. And that's more important than, and I, and I stress this, you know, on social media all the time, the most important thing for health tomorrow is how you are today. And I think one of the best ways to assess that is through what your capacity is. And it doesn't really matter what particular lab values show because they are highly variable and and we don't understand them all and they're very context dependent. We've had this, you know, in the medical community, we've had this over-reliance on laboratory values and people get hung up on that stuff. And I think it's, 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 it's really a problem. And I I completely agree with your approach. And I I think it's awesome that you, are more proponent of health than you are disease management, which is what a lot of the medical community community seems to be doing these days. But how did you, I don't, I don't feel, maybe it's your athletic background. I don't know, but I don't feel like most doctors uh, feel that way. So how do you feel like you, you, you became this, this way? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I was, obviously I was an athlete my whole life. I've always competed even, even while doing a busy surgical career. And so when I got to about 45, I was just not getting healthy. I mean, I was still training really, really hard. I mean, I was putting in all the time doing the work and I was still a good athlete. I was strong and fast, but I mean, I was just starting to get, you know, medical issues. My blood pressure was going up. I was developing sleep apnea. You know, I, I wasn't as lean as I wanted to be. I was probably pre-diabetic. And so at that, you know, I, I just took an inward look and I said, Hey man, I'm not going to put up with this. You know, I'm too, I'm too competitive for this. And so I really just delved into nutrition and I've spent the last five years really looking at it. And so I've, I've you know, I've evolved from, you know, low fat, uh, low fat, low calorie, you know, near vegetarian diet to a paleo diet, to a low carb diet, to a keto diet. And now I'm on this crazy all meat diet, which I've done for about a year now. And so I've just kind of experimented to see what would work best for me. And that's, you know, and so I think, you know, the problem with most physicians is we are not given the tools to, to get the job done when it comes to health and fitness. I mean, we we're taught what drugs are, you know, how to, defi- how to diagnose a, a, a particular medical problem. And then we, we, we know what, medicine to give or what procedure to do and there's some lip service you know very barely lip service given to nutrition and, and exercise and sleep and recovery and stress management that's all minimal stuff and so we're not our and so we're, we're like this is what i you know if you remember the movie independence day when the aliens were invading you know it's, it's kind of like that with chronic disease we've got this huge you know war against disease and basically physicians are given bb guns i mean because all this pharm- pharmacotherapy we have only is like a little BB gun against this huge alien horde. And so and, until you bring out the big weapons, which are nutrition, you know, exercise, you know, things like that, you're not going to get much, 
progress. And that's why we just have these people that continually, they go to the doctor and they, they return again, they keep going. And it's just medicine re- refill after medicine refill or adjusting your medicine. And they never really get better. It's extremely frustrating. Even in the practice that I was in, which was orthopedic surgery, where, you know, in a trauma situation, it's different. That's, that's different. But for the chronic disease stuff where, you know, your chronic arthritis, your chronic shoulder pain, I mean, you, you're literally putting on sophisticated and high-priced Band-Aids. And so, you know, the patient's knee may feel a little bit better from a knee replacement, but, I mean, they still have the disease that got them there. They didn't, you didn't fix an arthritis. You just limited one of the symptoms in, in one of the joints. And so what you'll do is the next year they'll be back for their other knee replacement. And three years later, they'll be, they'll be back for their hip repro- replacement. And then a year from later, a year after that, they'll be back for their rotator cuff surgery. So it's, it's not fixing the problem. And, and although it does improve people's quality of life a bit, it's a drop in the bucket. And I've really, you know, it really, uh, I, I'm more excited about doing the preventative stuff uh, than I am about the other stuff. And it's kind of interesting, you know, just, just spending a year on tr- Twitter talking to people about health and fitness. I've seen more dramatic, life-changing uh, stories than I had in two decades of practicing medicine, you know, conventional medicine. And so I think there's something wrong there. And I think we have this, you know, we've got this whole system that's designed to to treat the back end of disease. We, we train, you know, literally armies of, you know, radiology techs and lab techs and nursing assistants and all this ancillary staff. And what we, what we need is basically an army of prevention specialists. You know, we need, we need these people that you know, you can put it into people's homes and say, hey, this is how you need to eat. This is how we need to exercise. And that's how you solve the, high, the health care crisis in the country instead of throwing more money at it at, 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 at the end of it, end of the disease process, which is, a, is a, just a, fail, a, a losing strategy. Yeah, I think one thing you hit on there is like, yeah, if I got a if I got a gunshot wound, I, I definitely want to be in America in, in an emergency room here because of the amazing things surgeons can do. But when it comes yeah, to preventative care, uh, we're missing the boat, but it sounds like you've been, uh, you, you've done the fitness thing for a long time. You said you heavily got in nutrition over the last five years and you went the full spectrum there, you know, going from, you said basically vegan, vegetarian ish, uh, you know, then paleo keto and now to meat only. Uh, so can you talk about that transition? Why you cu- kept going essentially more, more and more low carbohydrate? Why, what was that progression and, and why did you do that? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'm very, you know, I, you know, like I said, I'm very skeptical and I'm very sort of objective and very self-critical about, you know, progress, especially, you know, when you, when you get to a level of athletics where you're able to break world records, you have to be very mindful of details and you have to be very, you know, just very um, uh, realistic about what works and what, what, what doesn't. And so, you know, as I, you know, as I kind of paid attention to my health, especially you know, when I was on a ketogenic diet, I started noticing things improving uh, health wise, which I thought, you know, I was just kind of stuck with the rest of my life. And, and I would normally attribute those things to just I'm getting older, you know, joint pain, you know, skin things, uh, energy, libido and things like that. So those things started to improve. <laughs> uh, and then I just kind of just kind of read about some other diets. And, you know, I looked at, you know, some of the old school bodybuilder stuff, you know, because I, I've never been a person that takes drugs. I've always been opposed to that. And so I wanted to tr- see what I could do to try to really, you know, improve what I could. And I, I came across, you know, Vince Carana's steak and egg diet, which was used, you know, for by some of the early bodybuilders in the fifties and sixties. And, you know, those guys built felt fairly decent physiques with probably, probably without stress steroids or at least minimal amounts of those. And so that was interesting to me. So I played around with that and I just felt pretty good, you know, just eating, you know, steak and eggs felt pretty good. So I would do that for a week here, two weeks there. And then, and then I kind of stumbled across this, what's called a zero carb community, which is, you know, it's actually a misnomer because it's just basically a carnivorous community. And I, I started reading these people that not only were, were, um, doing well, but they were, they were just getting really amazing health improvements. And most of the people that were there were, were people that were really sick. You know, these people that had these horrible autoimmune diseases like, uh, you know, problems like Crohn's disease and also colitis and morbid obesity. And all these people were saying, I just feel better. It's the best I've ever been. And a lot of these people were, well, they're either less, either a lot of them were eggs vegans and vegetarians, but there were a lot of them that came from a ketogenic background, which I think most of them do. And they were stating that, you know, 
my health improvements got even better. You know, things that keto didn't clear up, the carnivore diet did. So I thought that was intriguing. So I said, well, I'm just going to try it for a month and see what happens. And, you know, because I wasn't expecting that much. Because, I, you know, quite honestly, I enjoyed doing the keto stuff. I enjoyed having a little more variety. I enjoyed, you know, being able to make these ketogenic desserts occasionally and eating some fruits and, you know, berries and stuff like that. You know, the typical ketogenic diet stuff. Um, and I, and I certainly thought eating a bunch of salad and spinach was, was good for me, but I thought I'll, I'll just try this and see. And, you know, I got through the month and it was really easy and I felt really good the whole time. And then I went back and I said, well, I'm, I finished my month. And so I'll just add some, you know, some, a little bit of fruit back in and a couple of fruit. And I just, within a day or two, I started to feel kind of not as good. And so I said, well, that's weird. So I said, well, I'm just going to go back to this all meat thing and, and continue it. And I've just kind of continued that you know, for basically just about a year now. And the whole time I did that, especially after about two months in, I noticed a pretty significant improvement in my athletic performance. And this was without any sort of change to my training regimen because it's, it's been the same for years. And so that was interesting to me. I saw about a, you know, about an 8% improvement in my power output on the rowing machine and in my, you know, strength on, on certain lifts were just going up. And so I thought that was really, really interesting. And then I also noticed some things that were chronic, uh, things that I'd had, I had some, you know, one of the things I'd had for probably 10 years was this chronic quadriceps tendonitis. It never got better. It was always there in the background and it just finally went away. I mean, I haven't, I haven't had it, uh, you know, in, in almost a year. And so I, it's, it's kind of, I'm, you know, like I said, it's very interesting to me, especially someone whose background was heavily in the musculoskeletal stuff. And, you know, I, I know every trick in the book to how to deal with tendonitis and, you know, to see it go away after 10 years was, was truly interesting to me. And so I continue to see other things like little skin things, you know, as you get older, you, you get these skin issues that come up and I've seen those things just basically go away. And so it's, it's, you know, like I said, I think there are certain things we, we attribute to aging that are probably metabolic disease. And I think what I'm seeing is a reversal of that. And so what it seems like, it seems to me like I'm, I'm actually getting younger. I mean, what I think I'm doing is reversing size of disease and so that's, that's pretty exciting for me and I'm pretty pleased to do it. And, uh, uh, so that's where I'm at now. That's amazing. And I want to hit on a couple of things there, but first I want some clarification on the diet itself. So it is just meat only. Do you eat anything yeah. else? Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, well, I mean, that's what I do currently. Although, I mean, there are a lot of people that, you know, when they, especially when they start, you know, they, they they come from a background, you know, you're going to a meat only diet is extremely restrictive for most people uh the, at least the concept is and, and, and in practice it ends up being fairly liberating because you, you become just kind of free from food i mean you just kind of like okay here's my food i don't have to worry about it but i think when most people start what i did too is i started out with you know just animal products so that would include eggs it would include seafood and fish and butter and you know uh, some heavy you know some dairy heavy heavy cream you know cheeses uh and things like that and and, and those things are something that i I rarely eat anymore. You know, I, I, I you know, we, we started this study called n equals many.com or this website, another friend of mine, Matt my, Mayer, who's also a carnivore. And we just kind of said, we're going to do a, a 90 day study and everybody's going to do as much as possible meat and water. And so we had a bunch of people that signed up and we have several hundred people that, that, that went through that study. And I said, well, I'm going to do that too. So I, I dropped down to just meat only. And it's kind of interesting because the more you do it, that's all you really want. And it's, 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 it's just, you, you think it would be counterintuitive, but I mean, it, it's kind of like the more restrictive you get, you find out that that's really what you, you, you know, when I'm craving something, it's a steak. And, you know, I mean, I'll eat some eggs occasionally if, if, if they're there and I don't have any access to anything else, but it's not what I want. I mean, I just constantly find it that, that that is the most nourishing food and it's the most satiating food. And it's, and it's good every time, you know, I, if, if you know how to cook a steak and you learn how to cook pretty good you get pretty good at cooking steak after you do thousands of them so once you learn how to make a steak taste good i mean it's it's never a bad experience and so you know you go in there oh darn i gotta eat another ribeye steak you know you don't you don't have that sort of impression and so um yeah so it's it's you know i think there's a, a lot of people will still continue with other cuts of meat they'll do fish you know chicken pork, you know pork you know different you know, lamb um eggs and, and those things are fine too i think that's it's not a not an issue for most people there there are some people that will you know have an issue with dairy some people will find that dairy sort of has some negative impact on them it might 
for me, if I have a lot of dairy, it tends to affect my sleep negatively and tends to congest me. There's a lot of people that will notice that they, they tend to put on weight with dairy or it tends to, to, to uh, constipate them a little bit. But uh, that's that, I think that's individual. And so you kind of find out what works best for you. And it's kind of funny. Once you start to feel really good, you know, the, 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 when you add things in your diet that, that, that maybe aren't as good for you, you get some pretty quick feedback that, hey, man, that, that, my body doesn't really like that. And I don't like feeling that way. And so you kind of get this negative reinforcement, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you stray from the diet and there's a lot of people that do, I, I really haven't because I haven't any desire to, but I read all the time about people that say, hey, I went out and had a, you know, whatever binge on something and I feel awful now. I mean, and, they, and sometimes I'll feel awful for several days or several weeks after eating, you know, one, you know, one, what would normally seem like an innocuous amount of food. And one of the questions that comes up is, I know if we were to look at the, the, the breakdown of, uh, I'm sure an eight ounce piece of steak, you know, it does have a decent, uh, vitamin mineral profile, but are you, do you track any of that other stuff? Are you ever deficient or do you have to supplement with, uh, vitamins and minerals or anything like that? Yeah, so this is a this is a this is an interesting topic, and it's something. So I just I don't supplement with anything, and all I eat is basically steak. And so, and I, I can point to you people that have been doing this for ten, almost twenty years, and then, and then they're in the same situation. And so, what you have to realize um, is that the recommended daily allowances they were just, they were established back in the nineteen forties, and they've been updated, you know, periodically over the years. And so, the way they determined those was they looked at you know basically population, you know, big population subsets. And they looked at people that were eating a diet that was heavy in carbohydrates and grains. Okay. So what that means is basically, so what we do know is that when you eat a lot of carbohydrate, your nutritional requirements, the vitamin requirements and the cofactors and the mineral requirements are different than when you're not eating carbohydrates. So carbohydrate metabolism requires a different subset of things than say a a fat-based or or even a a meat-based diet. And so we know that those things are different. We also know that, you know, like a grain-based diet or a plant-based diet has a higher number of uh, things that are considered anti-nutrients. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, nutrition is bound up and inaccessible to us. And so what we have is a situation where you go from a, a a system that has a much higher, you know, carbohydrate based system, which has a much, much higher need for those nutrients and they're, they're, they're much more difficult to access to a system that has a lower requirement and the nutrients are much easier to access. And so, you know, the biggest pe- thing people would say is, you know, you know, scurvy. There's no vitamin C in meat. Actually, there is some. The US, USDA just didn't test it. And so when you look at other labs, they've shown that there is some vitamin C in meat. Uh, we also know historically that vitamin C was, was well known to be, uh, or scurvy was well known to be both cured and prevented by fresh meat doesn't mean you have to eat it right off the end. You know, it has to be, you know, not dried and processed and, and, and sitting on the shelf for ages. So if you eat like a steak from the grocery store, you're fine. And so that's, you know, the general theme. You can look at, you can point to a lot of those nutrients that meat is theoretically lacking, you know, based on the RDA. You know, the 2007, you know, International Organization of Medicine held a conference, to, you know, to evaluate the RDAs. And basically what was determined was that the RDAs were based on what's considered the lowest level of expert of, of data available, you know, the lowest level of uh, evidence available. And that was just expert opinion. So they basically had people that were just kind of uh, saying, I think this is what people need. And so there were no randomized controlled trials. It's kind of like the U S dietary guidelines, you know, they're not designed for individual persons they're in, they're designed for populations. And so if your assumption is everybody's eating, you know, a diet of, you know, 50, 60% carbohydrates and much of it's grain based, and then those RDAs hold up. But if you're not eating that way and you're eating like I do, or even on a uh, low carb diet, then those numbers, uh, as we're finding out, don't seem to, to, to make as much sense or they're not as applicable. That's crazy. And, and all, you're kind of opening my mind here with a lot of new information. I think that it's uh, really awesome. And uh, another thing. Yeah, well, I mean, oh, go yeah, go ahead. I was just to say my so my diet right now I'm I'm definitely so I'm not really in one camp or the other. I eat uh, a fairly clean diet, uh, majority fat, protein, uh, and lower carbohydrate, but not a low carb and not definitely not ketosis. Uh, that's just what seems to suit me best right now. Um, but I bet you make a lot of vegans mad. Well, I mean, you know, I, I it's not my intention. You know, I think I think you should eat whatever works for you. 
right? I mean, you know, if you can make a vegan diet work, great. I mean, there's a lot of people that can't make it happen. And there's a lot of people that, that end up quitting that. And so what we have, you know, in the vegan camp is, you know, I mean, most of them are good people. I know I've had friends that were vegans. That were, they're really great people. And I have no problem with you doing that. The problem is you get ones that are, you know, they just get really militant about it. And they just want to, you know, they, they're screaming meat is murder and demonizing you for eating stuff that makes you healthy. And I, I just think that's, you know, the wrong approach. I think everybody should find what works for them. And, you know, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, and it's going to vary over time, you know, I think that's the other thing. And I think you have to be objective about what's working and what's not. And so, yeah, I mean, there, there are obviously vegans that, that hate the fact that, that I am out there showing that meat can be healthy. And, I, and I've got, you know, if you go on Twitter, I've got just hundreds of people that are transforming the lives are going on a all meat diet and saying, I'm, I feel the best I've ever had. All these medical problems are going away. And I think one of the major issues we have with this whole meat is a bad food, even though we've been eating it as, a, you know, as, a, as humans, as a homogenous for three million years or so, maybe, maybe even longer probably, is that you know all that epidemiology conflates a meat eater to someone who's going to McDonald's and eating a bun with French fries, fried in vegetable oil, and a Coke, and an apple pie, and a, and a shake. You know? and so that's where we, we, we have to get away from that because all that data, all those associational studies, they never really sort that out. And so what happens, why it's so important to study these all meat eaters is because we're seeing that when you just isolate meat by itself, people's health becomes tremendously good. And so that's, you know, it, just, it flies in the face of this meat is bad for you. And so once, once people say, hey, wait, meat is really good for us, you know, and like I said, I'm still open to investigate that. And that's what I'm trying to promote and have people share data um, is that then that, that sort of argument falls away. And so if people start saying, well, maybe that's, not a bad thing, then we, we can look at how to make it more sustainable and we can look at ways to mitigate any environmental issues that are caused by this and not eliminate it from everyone's diet and to where, you know, my grandkids are in, are in a world where, you know, you can't get a, you can't get a steak and you're, you're, you're end up eating some synthetic soy lab creation that's, that mimics meat. And that's, I think that's, 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 uh, you know, that's a problem. Yeah. That's not a world I want to live in. <laughs> all right. Well, so I, I'm afraid that's where we're headed. I mean, I, you know, you see all this money being poured into this stuff and it's, you know, you've got these big companies that, you know, I mean, they're, you know, they'll, they'll go do it under the guise of altruism, but I mean, they're, they're just doing it for profit, just like all the processed foods. And they're going to be making processed animal, you know, fake animal products. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to buy off on that because we're going to think it's good for the environment and good for our health our health. And then we're going to be, you know, 30 years down the road here, all eating, you know, this, this fake food and and, and they're going to be making money and, and you and I's health is going to suffer. Are, are you in a state of ketosis? Uh, it depends, you know, and I think, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because I've never been one to track those things. I, I just, you know, what I know about ketosis, you know, as far as why it's useful to track and why it's not, you know, I think there's, you know, I'm producing ketones, you know, like I said, right now, I mean, you know, my meal frequency right now is about once a day. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not intentionally fasting. I, what I like to do is call it intermittent feasting. I mean, I'll put down four pounds of meat in one setting and then that, then I'm good to go for, you know, 18 to 24 hours before I need to eat again. Right? And I eat when I'm hungry. So, you know, the longer I go without food, I'm, I'm definitely probably producing ketones when I'm, in, when I'm, in, when I'm, depending on the intensity of my exercise level, I'm probably doing that as well, but I'm not intentionally trying to obtain ketosis. I'm not trying to hit some blood level, you know, because again, it, the, we even know that people have done this chronically, especially athletes, they tend to have this lower level than other people. And it's because they get more efficient in utilizing those ketones. And so there's a balance between production, utilization, and waste. And so those things all alter with time. And so right now I'm very efficient at utilizing ketones, no doubt. Uh, and I probably produce what I need to to, to allow me to use that. So I, I like I said, I, I can't say that I can point to a uh, beta hydroxybutyrate level in my blood because I just don't measure that. But I mean, I've I've had the, I've been in ketosis enough times to know what it, you know what it feels like. And I think that's you know you can say it's subjective. But I think most people can say, hey, I know what that feels like, and I know. Uh, you know, there are times when I do that. And then, and, and, you know, again, I've been studying this, and I've collected data on people, and I've had people that have, you know, registered blood, blood uh, ketone levels that were, that were elevated during all meat night. So I know there are times that 
And certainly people do this. And so the people that care to check, and I'm, I just happen not to be one of them, but the people that care to check, a lot of them will notice varying levels of ketosis. One thing I find very interesting about what you were saying is once you went to the meat diet, um, your power output increased on the rower, I think you said 8 or 9%, which is really amazing because typically when you're, people are working with fast twitch athletes or more power-based athletes, they they need they need sugar they need glucose uh you know that's typically and i say typically because you are obviously a huge uh proof that that's that it's not not necessary um so why do you think that your your performance increased on uh meat only diet yeah so i think you know and this is relative to a ketogenic diet so i think you know just in general terms one my health was better so i think you know especially as you as an older athlete if your health is better your joints don't hurt you feel better you're you know you recover better, you sleep better. You know, I think probably, and I can't, I, I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping we'll get more, more data on this. I think it probably has a, a positive net effect on testosterone. Um, I think those things all go into it just, just from a general training standpoint. But then I think when we look at an energetic standpoint, you know, when we look at how much, how much fat you're burning versus how much glucose you use for different, different exercises. Uh, there are some studies out there that are they're coming in with with ketogenic athletes because there's no real meat studies yet. I mean, no one's doing this, but I think that'll happen in the, in the coming years as more people are willing to adopt this. But what I'm seeing is that um, probably even at, you know when you get under you know when you when you're looking at things that are you know 10, 15 seconds you know or quick lifts like Olympic lifting or or just strength lifts you you know you're not you're not touching really much in the way of glycolysis, you know, you're all, that's all creatine, you know, creatine phosphate system. So that's sort of independent of, you know, what your diet is for the most part. Um, but once you get beyond 15 seconds out to, you know, you know, a minute, minute and a half, you know, you're, you're in this highly glycolytic range and it's in, people will call it anaerobic glycolysis. And that's where I do most of my competitive rowing at. And that's where I've broken world records in those areas. And so what I have found for me, and, you know, again, Again, I can do it, so I suppose, I suppose other people can as well. That um, I probably, you know, I'm still using sugar, you know, you know, because I, I don't. It's not that I'm walking around with no blood glucose. I mean, I'm making it from you know via gluconeogenesis, and I'm storing glycogen just like anybody else. It's just that I don't get it exogenously. I don't take it in through my diet, so I convert, you know, some percentage of the fat and protein that I take in into, you know, into, you know you know, either fatty acids for fuel, ketones for fuel, or, or glycogen or, 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 or glucose, you know, through gluconeogenesis. And so I am restoring those uh, pathways. And probably, you know, if you were to muscle biopsy me, you would find that I have, you know, a relatively high level of, 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 glu- of glycogen. Um, I don't probably tap into those at, at a level of intensity that other people would. So I probably am able to do much of what I do on fat. And it's only when I get to those last higher percentages that I actually draw from those glycogen stores, you know, the muscle glycogen stores. And so I probably, you know, I mean, obviously I'm able to put that output out. I mean, it's like I said, I've got, you know, I broke world records at it. So I'm at a very high level. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, the other thing I notice is I, I probably, you know, while I'm exercising, I, I probably produce a little less lactate than I used to, you know, lactic acid. And so that for whatever reason, uh, some of these really painful events aren't quite as painful for me that were that were more painful maybe two years ago, you know, and so I don't I don't quite get the I still do, but I don't get the awful burning. You know, when you do one of you, when you do one of these really hard rows or hard sprints, you know, you get this really awful, you know, lactic acid burning sensation, you know, with the hydrogen ion dissociation. And so I find that's a little bit less. And that probably allows me to, to maybe to tolerate that a little better. And so I think those things all in combination allow me to do this performance. And I think, you know, like I said, if you look at also, if you look at meat, you, know, you look what's in meat, you know, you've got carnison, which has uh, been shown to be an athletic supplement. You've got creatine, which is also an athletic supplement. You've got lots of uh, heme iron, which is helpful. You've got lots of protein. So it's, a, I mean, it's a pretty good, you know, it's a pretty good athletic performance supplement. You know, the only thing that's not in it really that's been shown as a legal supplement to work is basically caffeine. And so, I mean, you know, all the stuff that you, that you buy that actually works, you know, if you go to the, the health food store, the only things that actually work are, are mostly found in meat already. That's incredible. And okay. So, so someone's listening to this, they want to try out the meat only diet. What would your recommendations be for someone kind of transitioning to this lifestyle? 
Yeah, I think, you know, and it's kind of interesting because I'm putting together, and me and another fellow who's really interested, so we put together a little uh, system to, to transition people to onto an all meat diet and, and, and then also how to incorporate athletics into that. It's called a, it's called the carnivore, it's called carnivore training system.com. And so that's going to be launched here in a few days. And I'll go through you know, a lot of detailed explanation on this stuff, but I mean, the basics, you know, the basic things, uh, you know, there's two ways to do it. You know, and I, and I, I use the analogy of, you know, taking off a bandaid, you know, you can either rip it off real quick and get it over with, or you can slowly pull it off and, you know, and so there's pros and cons of both things. So you can slowly transition over, you know, and that, and that would be just kind of starting out, you know, doing some carnivorous days and, and gradually extending how long you do that and starting eliminating other foods. Or you can just go whole hog and say, I'm just going to stop everything cold turkey and, and just, just start out right away. And I've seen people have success with both of those. And both of those have their, you know, it's an ad- adaptation period just like any diet changes. You know, whether you go to a vegan diet, you're going to have some ad- ad- adaptation changes. Whether you go to a ketogenic diet, there's going to be some adaptations to take place. And the same thing with a carnivore diet, even, even if you came from an already ketogenic background. And so I think that uh, the biggest advice I give people and the biggest problem that people have is just say they, they tend to under eat, you know, because what you, what you do is, you know, it's hard to put down two pounds of meat in one setting. I mean, most people can't do that. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, it's kind of even one pound for a lot of people is like, well, that's a big steak. And so, I mean, it takes time to do that. And so people end up and because it's so filling, I mean, they tend to under eat and then they end up being a little bit, you know, low energy and a performance lags. And so I think the, you know, and, and at the same time, you, you know, your body is transitioning over. So it takes a while for you to adapt metabolically to basically new fuel source. And so you have to up ramp, up regulate, you know, certain enzymes, certain pathways that are going to, that are going to maximize your utilization of the fuel. So that takes a period of time. And, and, you know, probably, you know, the ketogenic literature suggests it takes about three weeks to switch over. I know from my standpoint, especially with when you put athletics in there, it's much longer. And I think it's a, it's a many month process, quite honestly. And I think it takes, you know, probably when I went on an all meat diet, my, my athletic um, performance was either slightly down or no better for the first couple months. And then by about th- two and a half to three months, it really, that's when I started these really just started noticing these big improvements. And so I think that's what, that's what it took, you know, it takes for me. And, and I'm sure everybody's a little bit different, but that's, that's kind of a general scheme. I think the other thing is people will, you know, like I said at the beginning, uh, the variety sometimes helps, you know, having bacon and eggs and, you know, and, and, you know, shrimp and other things that are really tasty are available all the time, you know, because what happens is, you know, we live in a, we live in a society that, very different than what it was when our species was growing up. If we went back 50,000 years ago, if you look what was available to us, you know, we would have, obviously we had these big fatty animals that we hunted to extinction. We had some seasonal berries and we probably could forage for some other foods. Vegetables really, we didn't, we hadn't really cultivated them yet. So most of the, most of the, you know, most of the, if you go out and go out in society right now and go outside and try to eat every plant you see, 99% of it, you can't eat. It'll make you sick. You know, if you go out and eat leaves off a tree, you'll just get sick. So we hadn't really, you know, part of the diet, you know, grains came in and about 12,000 years ago. There was some evidence that people were maybe eating them a little earlier, um, but, but in significant quantities, we don't know. But, but so, but today in 2017, I mean, you've got the processed refined carbohydrates everywhere. You've got around the clock, you know, around year round fruits and vegetables. It's not a problem to get. So, culturally it, it seems like it's a weird diet you know but in but in but in terms of human evolution it's probably not that unusual and so i think that you know you have to kind of psychologically get over the fact that i'm going to step away from what everybody else is doing and and just say you know i'm going to try to see what that works best for my body and, and you know maybe this is it maybe it's not but i think it's it's you know like i said the biggest probably the biggest hurdle is the psychological hurdle i don't think the physical hurdle is that tough i think most people find that a lot of people within a week or two they're like hey i feel great this is no problem you know from a physical standpoint but there's just that psychological you know how to do it how to deal with social situations and the best way I found, the best strategy for that is just to be so damn full from eating so much meat that that stuff doesn't even look good to you. And that, and that's, you know, I tell people, I tell people at the beginning, eat meat like it's your job. And, you know, some people will get that and, and you know, and they don't worry and don't worry about what the, if you put on weight initially, you know, the, the, the initial goal is 
you know, because, you know, whether people believe in sugar addiction or not, there are a lot of food that we have a hard time resisting out there. And what I have found more so than any other diet out there um, is that I can fill up on a bunch of steak and then I have no desire to eat that brownie or that piece of chocolate cake or that donut or whatever, you know, the potato chips or, or even the, the, the banana that's in front of me. I just, I just don't have a desire to do that. So I think that's different from when you're on like a low carb or a ketogenic diet where you're always kind of have those foods as, as options in the background. They're always kind of tempting you. And I think that is one of the, you know, when I say it's very restrictive, but then again, it's very, very freeing because you're freed from these urges of different food. And is there a reason that you kind of settled on uh, primarily beef? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really like the way it tastes, <laughs> uh, you know, but I mean, it's, you know, I think, and again, I think this goes back to our evolution to some degree. I think if you look at, you know, if you, if you look at what humans were eating, you know, 50,000, 30,000 years ago, it was largely a lot of these big ruminant grazing animals. You know, it was mammoth. It was, you know, it was elk. It was, you know, the oryx, you know, it was, it was antelope. It was reindeer, you know, especially, you know, especially in, in Europe. And so, uh, so that's what I think a lot of what we, what we sort of evolved on, you know, I mean, I, you know, humans will eat any animal they can get their hands on. It's pretty clear, but I think that, profile you know and, and and i think the animals you know were were, were big and they're they're were, they were relatively fatty and so I, I think when you you think take a thing like a ribeye steak or a t-bone steak i mean it has a, a, enough flavor profile and fat profile that i think that mimics as good as we can in modern times you know there's no there no there are no mammoths for us to eat these days you know they're gone so i think that's the best thing that mimics what we probably had from a meat standpoint back then i think lamb is other is also another excellent option you know i'll eat you know i don't eat much pork i don't eat much chicken i don't eat much fish and i think those things to me i mean just from a from a from a satisfaction standpoint are, are just not as satisfying i think again this is a unique subset of population and once you study these people who have been doing this for years they'll all tell you the same thing i mean it's like those other things just don't get the job done. You know, if I eat a chicken, I'm, I'm still hungry. I don't feel like I've nourished myself. And I think if you look at some of the nutrient profiles on chicken and pork and, and, and things like that, and you compare them to beef, I think they're, they're different. And they're, they're, they're just generally not as nutritious. And do you, uh, does it matter to you what type of meat you're eating? Like, are you trying to get grass-fed beef or does it really matter? What do you do there? Yeah, so this is a very controversial topic and I upset a lot of people when I say that. But I think... You know, if we take away any ethical and environmental arguments, I think the nutritional difference between grass-fed beef and conventional grain-fed beef that you get in the U.S. is not very big as far as how it impacts human health. And there's a lot of people that will sort of, you know, say, well, the omega-6 ratios and omega-3 ratios are different. And that's true, but the absolute amounts are really small. And then, and then if you want to make that argument, you know, you can say, well, then don't ever eat chicken and don't ever eat pork and don't ever eat any other food out there because all of that is much higher in omega-6 and so if you if you just look at grass-fed versus grain-fed and then compare that to chicken or pork the difference is huge so grass-fed versus grain-fed is minimal so i think it's minimal the other op the other thing people talk about is hormone uh you know hormones that are fed to animals and so i think you know the main thing they do is they implant you know these animals with estrogenic hormones and in, in a little ear implant and so when you look at the amount of hormone that, that shows up so if you get a grass-fed animal you're still getting estrogenic hormones because you know you know they, they naturally have that you, 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 i mean you're not it's not like you're not getting any hormones when you when you add that implant in there it increases the percentage a little bit and then if you compare that to what's in milk what's in butter you know we're talking about animal hormones you're, you better not eat milk or butter you know because those things have even more hormones than even grain-fed animals and then if you want to if you want to look at the phytoestrogens then you're then those things are millions of fold if you look at soy and stuff like that, peanut butter, you know, even bread, they have much more of these phytoestrogens. And so I think that even the hormone argument doesn't hand up. The only other argument there is, is basically on antibiotics. And most, you know, the way it's supposed to happen in the U.S. is animals are not supposed to go to slaughter filled up with, with antibiotics. And so that the levels are extremely low or non-existent. And so it doesn't really impact your nutrition. Um, you know, I, I eat almost not exclusive. I eat some grass fed stuff, but I mean, you know, the, 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 the sad truth is it's, it's, it's very expensive. And most people, especially on a carnivore diet, just can't afford to eat three or four pounds of grass fed steak every day. It's just cost prohibitive for most people. Um, and so I, I, again, I think if you just put things in relative perspective, if you can afford to eat grass fed beef and your, your ethics lead you there, 
then I, that's what you should do, no doubt. If you can't afford it, then I think you know the next best option. I think is probably ninety nine percent is good. Is just go with the conventional stuff that you can afford. And then if you you know, and then and then you compare that relative to all these other things. You know, if you want to worry about pesticides and and you know uh, chemicals, then you can't eat any plant based food because this you know that's how that's raised. Even the organic stuff. You can look at what's in a plant naturally, and there's all kinds of natural pesticides in there that we ingest. In fact, there was a study in the 1990s by a guy named Bruce Ames, who's a world famous toxicologist, who looked at that and he found that basically 99.9% of all the pesticides that you and I eat are naturally occurring plant pesticides that they're, the plants naturally produce. And by the by the way, and this is not to scare people, but by the way, of those that are normally eaten by people on a daily basis. We tested 52 of them and found that 27 of those were carcinogenic in animals. And so it's like, you know, you've got this, you know, food you eat every day that it causes cancer in rats in high doses. And the same argument has been made to say that meat causes cancer because in a few in a few rat studies they, they showed some precancerous lesions. But you can show that in in the in the in the plant literature as well. The only difference is that one has epidemiology to support it. And, and I pointed out before, the epidemiology is extremely bad. You know, it's confounded. So it's basically, we have this really bad epidemiology that says meat eaters who don't really care, who smoke more, who drink more, who don't wear their seat belts, who don't go to the doctor, who generally just don't give a crap about their health, are more likely to get disease than people who are vegetarians and vegans. So that's, what, that's where the epidemiology comes from. Now, again, the mechanistic stuff, you can say that I've got a rat study that shows you know, I can I can induce cancer or a precancerous lesion in a rat by feeding a, a rat a bunch of sugar and give them an agent to make them get cancer and genetically breed them to get cancer and then feed them super high doses of uh, processed meat along with sugar. That'll give them cancer. But, but you got, you know, and there's a whole bunch of rat studies that show there's a study out there that showed bacon was protective against cancer in rats. So it's mm-hmm. it's just com- it's just comical. And so so anyway. I think I got. I think I just kind of lost my point. No, you uh, you covered it really well. You kind of eating the organic versus conventional meat, and I think that you've uh, done your homework and and know why you're doing what you're doing. So I think that's that's awesome. I just I had to ask with consuming meat only. You know the the types and kinds. I was wondering if that mattered. And uh, yeah, I think it mattered. I think it. You know, like I said, I think the impact is at best extremely minimal. Now, now uh, to be fair, I have talk to some people that say they feel better eating grass-fed beef and so i don't discount that fact so it may be something you have to play with if you were to if you were to do that and certainly if your ethics put you there i think that's fine too but i think i think to make a big nutritional argument is hard to do you know i think you can make an ethical and environmental argument but i don't think you can make a nutritional argument that's very that holds up very well in my view almost any nutritional argument is hard to make these days when you can cherry pick studies and you know in almost any direction uh it can it can be very difficult to have like a conversation if one person is in one camp and another person's in another camp it's just it's almost like a religion at that point you know yeah i mean one of the things that i try to to tell people is you know and, and that's very true i mean i certainly can cherry pick studies and i do all day all day long just to prove my point that hey these studies are out here and we can make whatever hypothesis we want it's not that uh, there's one right answer, and, and even experts disagree. I mean, there, it's widely contentious what the best food is for people. And so you can go into the literature and find studies that support your point of view and, and spend years studying this stuff. But in the end, the, the only thing that matters is that you figure out what works for your health. And so, again, that's what I encourage people to do is, is test it and be very objective, and, 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 and you need to measure what matters. And so when I talk about how you should determine what health is. And so I think here's a problem I have. You know, a person will go on whatever diet. Say they go on a ketogenic diet and they'll lose a bunch of weight. They'll get lean. They'll, they'll feel the best they've ever felt in their life. I mean, their joints stop hurting. Their mood is better. They're energized. Their skin is better. You know, they're happy. They feel really wonderful, right? By all accounts, most people will say that person is healthier than the person that was overweight, depressed, had no energy, your joints hurt, your skin was bad. There's no question about that in most people's mind until you get to the doctor's office and then the doctor does your blood work and your LDL is up or your cholesterol is up. And so now people get in there and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm killing myself because what happens is we have some, again, associational epidemiologic studies that will suggest that maybe 
uh, higher LDL is associated with heart disease. Now, when you, when you really pick that apart, I think we're finding that that stuff, those associations don't really hold up and there's much better things to check. But at the same point, I think you have to really trust yourself and saying, I'm healthier this way. I don't really care what a lab value says. I mean, I'm not, I'm not to totally saying totally dismiss lab values, but you have to put that in context. And I think we're finding out that, you know, like we talked about with the RDAs, that a lot of these lab values don't apply to particular, you know, populations depending on what their diet is. And so the same thing with, you know, all these all these standard reference ranges were determined on high carbohydrate eating people. And so, you know, we want to look at your thyroid reference range, you want to look at your blood cholesterol reference range. All these numbers were determined based on using these studies in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, on people that are eating high carb diets, so we, we don't really know what a lot of those things. When we're, when we're looking in terms of chronic disease, are truly healthy and truly not. And so people get hung up on these lab values, and I I just tell people to to really think about it because you know I you know if you look at an animal, and you know if you look at what animal is is sick, you know if you're out in the wild and you're a lion and you're hunting a pack of you know wildebeest, you're going to pick the one that's slow, that's got a limp. That that you know that can't get away, and, and, and you know, and again, the same thing can be said about humans. Not that we're running from lions or anything like that, but I mean, generally, again, if you're if you're stronger, if you're faster, if your joints don't hurt, if you can move better, if you're leaner, you don't have extra body body fat. If you if you if you have better 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 energy, by my de- definition, I think any sane pers- person's definition, you are a healthier person. I think that's where you should that's how you should determine what your health is, and don't. Don't get hung up on my HDL went down five points based on the last study. My turn wrestling went up 20 points. Those things are inconsequential. They're, they're minor. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. All right, Dr. Baker, I want to move to the quick fire questions of the show. Are you ready? Uh, well, I hope so. I don't know. We'll see. I'm sure. <laughs> All right. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? Uh, you know, I did a workout one time where I did, uh, I did a set of squats, uh, 135 pounds for 100 straight reps. Uh, that was that was pretty brutal. It took me about ten minutes, and I, I couldn't walk for about three days afterwards. <laughs> I, I, that one that one peaks out is pretty hard for me. Um, yeah, I've got several on there, but that, that's that's pretty bad. I tell you, one other thing that I find is really difficult is an all out one minute sprint on an airdyne bike. That that is that always makes me feel like I'm going to die. That'll so that's it. that's a pretty hard one. All right, in your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the biggest mental, the biggest activity of building mental tech, toughness is probably just succeeding and just, you know, just pushing yourself to, to higher and higher levels every, every single opportunity you get. I think it's just a, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a feedback mechanism. If you have success with one thing, you can always draw on that to, to, to push you through to the next level. All right. And if you could have only one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Wow, um, man, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a little bit of a tough thing. I mean, I assume I'd be doing some body weight stuff. Otherwise, one piece of equipment so I can. I would probably, honestly, I would pick, I would pick a, probably about a thirty pound medicine ball. Okay, yeah, a lot of different things you can do with that. Yep. All right. Now here's the question of the show. What is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? And this is 100% open-ended. Wow. So I think, you know, I think you need to take, you know, one thing I think you need to prioritize your health. I think you need to, uh, you know, and I think you just need to see what your, what your, what you can contribute in a world. You know, I think it's, you know, find out something you enjoy doing and, and just do it and don't worry about financial you know, financial gain or, uh, material status. I think, I think you're going to be happier doing what you enjoy and doing it well and sharing it with other people. And then, and then those other things will come if they're meant to come. But I think if you, if, if whatever you do revolves around getting a bigger house or a nicer car, nicer clothes or social status, I think ultimately that's going to leave you pretty empty in the end. I love that. All right, Dr. Baker, uh, you've mentioned a lot of interesting stuff and resources, but what's the best place for people to learn more about you and what you're doing if they want to get some more information here? Yeah, so I think there's three. I mean, I'm pretty active on Twitter, and so that's going to be S. Baker, M.D., 
Uh, and then I, I've got an Instagram page, which shows a lot of my, just my workout stuff is, is, uh, uh, Sean Baker, 1967. And then I think the other thing, like I said, I'm excited to be involved with is carnivore training system.com. And so that's going to be launching. So I'll, I'll have a lot of videos talking about some of this stuff and, and it's going to be just putting people through the workouts that I do that I've found success with, you know, but it's what I've done to, to break world records in, in multiple different sports and my general training philosophy. And it really cuts through a lot of the BS. And, and, and I really, what I'm emphasizing is things that are, that are one, number one, they're effective. They're, they're usually the best tool that I found for the job. They tend to be safe and they tend to be easy to use. I mean, it's, you know, I think if, if, if you have something that's, difficult to learn or difficult to use it's not very not very good obviously safety is a big concern and then yeah i see one, one of the problems i see is people using tools for the wrong job they're not the best tools for the job and so they waste a lot of time and so if anything i hope people will you know stop by and, and you know hopefully it'll prevent people from wasting time and it'll help people to um you know if they want to if they want to uh, learn how to how i implement a carnivore system and how it, how it integrates with 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 you know what i think is better health and, and that's a, a good resource for them awesome and i'll link to all of that information uh on the show notes of this episode but dr baker it's been a blast i really appreciate your time today wonderful hey and yet, thank you very much always whine about their best. <laughs>